Steve, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. We would love to have you make a few opening comments, and then we'll take it from there with some questions. Well, it's a, a privilege and, a, and an honor to join you for this conversation. Uh, I hope that some of the things I can I share today can provoke uh, new thoughts in your minds about how to think and understand uh, issues related to policy towards China, how to understand what you're seeing in the news, uh, and what we as a constitutional republic need to do to overcome what I see as some pretty significant challenges that come from the Communist Party of China. Uh, I have what some friends might call the gift of gab, and so I will try to keep things brief uh, and cover a little bit of an introduction that gives a background to how to jump into a question like TikTok or some of the other policy issues that are before our top policymakers today. There's a hearing that is going on this week with a new select committee on China in the House of Representatives that will focus on the malign influences of the Communist Party of China in the United States and other issues. Uh, there is a markup of a bill this week in the House of Representatives that addresses TikTok. Uh, there's also news breaking about the origins of COVID and what our government thought it knew before and what it now has rediscovered what it knew after going through three years of our own national experience and experience around the world. But if you begin at what I would call the beginning, a lot of people think of China as a multi-thousand year old cultural civilization and country. And what they don't really have a feeling for is just like all the rest of the world, there were small kingdoms, fiefdoms, and wars that came and went over that territory, large and small. Uh, there were classic texts called the Three Kingdoms and other times. China, the idea of China as a unified dominant culture is a myth. Uh, but it is a powerful myth, and it's one that animates the way Chinese people define their identity. It's an, a myth that the Chinese Communist Party uses to its advantage now. And it's a myth that's informed a lot of our leaders over most of my lifetime and well before it. Uh, there are a couple of very big impulses when it comes to America's historical outreach and dealing with China. One is what we would call the missionary impulse. And in one part of my life, I was one of those impulsive missionaries that was going out into the world to try to convince people to be open-minded to my beliefs, but also to learn where they were and to try, try to connect. And if you think of that simple act of proselytization uh, it's replicated in a lot of other parts of life. It's not just in religion. It plays into advertising. It plays into diplomacy. It plays into marketing generally for almost anything. It's the simple idea of trying to see where someone is. And through the course of your relationship building, trust and communication, can you bring them closer to where you are or where you would like them to be? And that is what our great cultures and nations have been doing between the United States and China for centuries. The Communist Party of China was engaged in a civil war that actually conducted a cultural revolution against all things that they called old. And that included the key institutions of society, the family, religion, Confucianism, and all kinds of pillars that defined what the self-governing entities that were the dynasties in China before. Uh, and that cultural revolution is something that gets studied in our history classes from the 1960s through the mid 70s. It's relevant today because I think as we discuss TikTok and try to put that into context briefly here, that cultural revolution is now modernized. Uh, we, the, since the 1970s, the United States and the free world have shared very generously a tremendous amount of technological know-how, education opportunity, access to markets, privileged access for the Chinese people to come to America and around the world to learn and bring that back into China. We see a lot of things that are labeled made in China, but the reality is Almost nothing is invented under today's China, under the Communist Party. It is all almost, as you might say, from a wedding myth of something borrowed and something you know, comes from others. They're gifts, they're stolen, they're borrowed, whatever it might be. 
But what the, the People's Republic of China has been very masterful at doing is taking the good things the world had to offer, while with a degree of ruthlessness that is alien to most Americans, maintaining tight monitoring and control over their own people. Uh, now, so today, we speak about technology as kind of a starting point for our conversation, but we'll address some other issues too. And if you think back to the 1990s, which may be before some of you were born, uh, but certainly was not before all of you were born, uh, in the 1990s, many of us believed that the internet and a lot of these online technologies would be liberating. It was the final frontier of free speech and free association. It was so powerful, it couldn't be controlled by the tyrannies around the world. And if we were able to crack open the window of information, free people would emerge with a, with a stake holding in the, the sort of global benefit that they would prosper financially, they would grow educationally, their children would have a better life, and it would allow differences to narrow and opportunities to expand. It was a beautiful dream. Uh, and in many ways, the internet and related technologies that came out of it did a lot of that. But it also brought great opportunities for authoritarians around the world to use these exact same tools for monitoring, manipulation, and control, even oppression. Uh, it allows for the control of what the world can see, but also allows for the control over what your citizens and others can see. Uh, it allows for you to control not just a narrative, but the psychology and behaviors of the people that partake of this product. So. This is the, the background into which I would enter the TikTok conversation. For many people, TikTok is a seemingly innocuous way to lose your mind for a few minutes or a few hours at a time. There is nothing redeeming about this other than the soothing feeling it gives you to let go of the problems that otherwise are in your life or confusion or headaches you have from studying or work or whatever else. It's an escape. Uh, and that escape literally unleashes chemicals in your brain and in your body that have an effect on you. And people who are extremely smart, who sometimes might have your best interests, but sometimes might not have your best interests at heart, have studied for generations how to use this physiological and psychological effect to get people to behave differently. It might be to just get you to purchase a certain brand of toothpaste. It might be to get you to buy a certain kind of clothing. It might be to get you to subscribe to a channel, a newsletter, or something else. But it also can be used to literally psychologically control a society. In China, that is how the algorithm for TikTok and many other platforms are used. They take words and images out of circulation to make sure that those forbidden topics are not allowed to cross the eyes and the minds of their people. Sometimes those things could be historical events. I saw secondhand, but by way of my time in Taiwan, how the Tiananmen protests of 1989 built up and then were crushed. I saw live news broadcasts of students and bi bicycles mangled by tanks, shot by the military that was brought in to disperse the protesters. There are two generations of Chinese people who speak with no knowledge of the Tiananmen incident. And it wasn't an incident, it was a massacre. And it wasn't just in Beijing, it was in other parts of China too. Uh, and that's just one piece of how they use what should be liberating technologies to control their people so that they don't rise up and protest, realize there are more of them than there are of the Communist Party members. Because if that ever happened, the billion plus ordinary Chinese people could flick the Communist Party off of their skin like a mosquito trying to take their blood. Uh, and the Communist Party knows that. Now, what challenge we face today in America is the internationalization of this. Many of you know that as you watch TikTok, that you, your clicks and what you watch are going to be mined by the people who control the data. And in so doing, they will feed you what they think you want to see that matches up with what they would like to show you. But you might be surprised to learn that in China, the algorithm for TikTok emphasizes 
trade schools, professional skills, building up prosperity and opportunity. Some of the propaganda myths of the Communist Party and kind of the nationalistic themes of China today. But in your algorithms, you might have some spicy dancer performing some interesting routine that while it might be entertaining to you in a moment, I would argue it probably isn't advancing your professional career. It probably isn't stimulating thoughts about how to grow and build our country. Uh, and so we collide with a constitutional republic that values free flow of information and free speech, free association, leaving it to our people to choose how they want to engage the world and what they want to use to engage the world. Now, we don't have kind of the wild, wild west when it comes to these things. There are barriers and guidelines. Uh, when it comes to advocacy for terrorism, you don't have free speech in America. Uh, and there are other areas where we have some concerns. But if the people who own the data and control the data of TikTok want to sow dissension, to make you less happy because they know you will purchase more products to soothe yourself if you are less happy. If they know that they can make you less likely to associate with different groups who might take a strong America but weak on China approach, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways that, they, that, a, that a foreign power who seeks to divide or otherwise influence America could take advantage of this. And that is what the current challenge is today. No matter what the business entity that TikTok operates under might be, the cloud-based data is open to manipulation, mining, and use by the ultimate controlling influence in TikTok, and that's the Communist Party of China. Uh, some of you probably know, but I'll end my uh, sort of Senate filibuster discourse with this. You cannot have free speech in China. You cannot have an independent company in China. Every business entity of any consequence has a Communist Party cell inside of it. There are no exceptions. Whether you're foreign or domestic, joint venture, no matter what your industry, the party is embedded in everything. Uh, and so we see this effort to shape what the world knows or thinks about COVID. We see this effort to shape what the world knows or thinks about China's trade practices, a balloon and what it may or may not have been. And we see this effort to try to divide Americans by all kinds of categories, to try to suggest that we have no standing to criticize the genocide the Communist Party is engaged in against the Muslim minority Uyghur population in the Northwest, to speak out against the crushing of the pillars of freedom of the people of Hong Kong that they had for over a century that in recent years under a national security law have put some of the best entrepreneurs of the world in prison and they remain in prison today. And some of the most important industries on this planet to your smart devices and smart life today live and manufacture and operate out of free and democratic Taiwan the subject of one of the great threats of the Communist Party today. So I don't want to, to make this all completely dark, but I do want you to have a sobriety checkpoint at the outset of the conversation that we face a determined, powerful, rich, and ruthless enemy. That enemy is not the Chinese people. It is not the Chinese population and culture. Those are beautiful things. The Communist Party is actually the enemy of all of that, but it's also an enemy of the American Republic and its constitutional founding. And that's why I think it's imperative for us to be educated, to be engaged, from whatever point of view we enter this, that we protect those pillars that uphold our freedom to agree and disagree securely and freely within this constitutional republic. That, I think, is the ultimate win, and that's what I think will put us in a better position to overcome whatever the Communist Party of China wants to put at us. So with those openings, going over time, I have no doubt, I'd be happy to take uh, questions and carry the conversation. But thank you for leaning into the conversation. I hope that we can encourage you to take this up 
throughout the rest of your life, because I think this is a civilizational challenge and brick by brick, step by step, relationship by relationship, we can build a better future together that overcomes this. Well, thank you, Steve. That was fascinating. And we just appreciate your your time to, with us today so much. Janine, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know you've got some questions and, and then we can just uh, kick it off from there. Well, first of all, Steve Yates, I, I found that to be mesmerizing your opening and beautifully diplomatically stated <laughs> I am now your biggest fan. <laughs> I want to hand you <laughs> an you. Emmy. I think I think I'm going to create a, an internet award to be able to give you. I, I'm just I listen to how you put that forth in such a non-threatening, non-partisan, uh, diplomatic manner. In 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 I've heard, and I think it should just be encapsulated and played on national television. I mean, it was brilliant, um, and I, I'm just so incredibly impressed by you and and I think that um you stated it in a way that that I haven't heard a single congressman or woman or senator say yet I mean all they they really keep focusing on they're getting all your information they're getting all your information and and all of us are like well everybody has their information anyway <laughs> you know what I mean the yeah. apple has my information the, the and so no one is understanding but when you said they want to psychologically control society. Um, that is, that's the danger of what they're doing. And when you talked about how in their country, they're talking about, you know, moral, you know, values and prosperity, but over us, they, they want to divide and demean and denigrate our culture and, so that we just, just fall apart and then they can come right on in. And I think the psychologically control society is, is something that's, that's uh, really well stated. And, and I, I want to get that message. I'm going to call my senator. <laughs> I'm going to call my senators and my congressmen. And I'm going to say, Steve Gates was on the show today. And this is what you need to be saying. Because the information aspect uh, isn't, no one's buying that. Uh, and no one understands that. But to think of their psychological power, I mean, I heard of, and I don't want to go on forever. I want to make sure everyone has time to talk. But, I, you know, there are also videos that they play that are political videos of Americans saying things against our political figures, and they're not even legitimate. They are produced by China to influence us. Um, and it's incredibly, incredibly, uh, and you talked about sowing dissension, how they want to sow dissension, and that's how they win. And, and, Jewel and Jorn and Aubrey and Kathy and Tova have all probably heard me talk about this, but when I, in 1982 or three, I filmed a major motion picture in communist China and I've experienced it. It was maybe a little four, eight, four, it was right before Tiananmen Square. And I, one of the men on our set was, was older, you know, in his sixties, right? He went through the cultural revolution and he would take us aside and tell us quietly you know, what it was like and how horrible it was and the artists and the doctors and the, the, the intellectual uh, society and, and moral people and religious people, how they were all, you know, 20 millions and millions of people killed and sent off to, and they were just annihilated. And I could see it in people's faces. I could see mm -hmm. the older generation who knew what life was like before. And then there was this middle generation talking about what you are saying. There's a, there are two generations that don't even know about Tian, Tiananmen Square because they, they're not allowed to know it. There was that middle generation who lived, been born and lived under this communist society who just seemed vacant. They just seemed mm. completely. And then there was a younger generation who was starting to get wind of the world. And they, they were curious and they wanted to talk. But they were, if we talked to them or changed money with them, we were followed. Our luggage was gone through. They took notes when we left the room. And people just don't understand what it's like over there. So the danger with TikTok is, is exactly what you're talking about, this psychologically uh, to control our society and how we're going to have to prevent that. And and so, you know, I probably just to talk, but I, I will ask two quick questions for quick answers so everyone has time. Was Nixon wrong to open China? At this so point, I, I would say yes. Yeah. And with the benefit of hindsight, they clearly made concessions that they did not need to make. 
Uh, and so what is usually called the best and the brightest gave their, the advice that they had at the time. But if it, what you were describing, uh, when in the 1960s, the best and the brightest experts on China from the West didn't have access to China. There was no way to know what was going on. It's like parachuting into New York City and thinking the rest of America is like that. They had no way to gauge how weak or how strong the Communist Party's hold on power was. Uh, I would say that the Communist Party of China was a hair's breadth from losing the mandate of heaven and going by the wayside. And for the, the logic of the Cold War that Nixon and Kissinger were living with at the time, that a lot of our leaders bought unquestionably, and for all I know, they were right. I was just a tiny kid at the time. Uh, they, they, they made a bargain that I don't think they needed to make. Among those bargains was leaving the status of Taiwan undetermined. Uh, we had official diplomatic relations with the Republic of China on Taiwan at the time. We did not need to give that up. We did not need to state opposition to Taiwan independence at the time. It was, I think, the weak-minded, academic-oriented bargainers that did that at the time because it's hard for people in this generation and time to remember how demoralized and depressed the free world was in the dark days of the Vietnam War. There was actual belief that the Soviet Union might be winning the, the Cold War. And so needing to get China on our side to balance against the Soviet Union is inconceivable to people today, but it was a huge issue that weighed on their minds. So I would give a degree of grace to them operating in their own time and context. At the same time, I think the sin is not in making the bet. The sin is in ignoring the returns on that bet. For far too long, unquestionably, Congress after Congress, president after president, and other leaders around the world took this myth and just kept it going long after the Cold War was over, long after the Tiananmen Square massacre, and long after the profound theft of technology and other kinds of things. And essentially, we fed a threat that we didn't need to feed. And now we are dealing with a deeper, more entwined challenge in our culture and civilization than the Soviet Union could ever have imagined. So, sorry, a little longer on the answer, but I, but I yeah. do think they have to give at least a portion of grace that, yeah, mm -hmm. they were wrong, but they operated in their own time and, and circumstance. Mm -hmm. But when I mm -hmm. look at it now, I'm wholeheartedly mm -hmm. on the side that it was a mistake that we are paying for. And in fact, the Chinese people are paying for very interesting. I've, I've, that, that's a very graceful way to look at that. That, it, that that's why history is important. It, because instead of just making general blank statements today about what life was like then, you need to understand what life was like then and what led them to make those decisions. And uh, so we, you know, giving grace about in the context of the Cold War. My dad was at West Point and was flying, uh, you know, in, in the Air Force because West Point was Air Force Army back then during the Cold War. So and I was I'm a child of the Cold War, um, yep. but. Uh, that uh, to, to, to give them some grace in that context. But as you say, the generations after that should have should have been privy and caught what was going on and, and made some changes. And that's that's unfortunate. Okay, I'm gonna toss it. I could talk to you all day, but I'm gonna toss you to Tova now. And once again, I just uh, think you're marvelous, marvelous. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you so much for being on and giving us an overview of this, um, the threat of Chinese misinformation. Um, and I guess one of my main questions is, um, there's like parallel to this um, Chinese effort, there's also been a lot of information on the Russian effort to sort of similarly sow disinformation and um, divide the US population, particularly around election times, and also using more like US uh, based social media companies such as Facebook um, and Twitter. Um, and, you know, the FBI has been investigating a lot into um, R Russian disinformation and how they've also been attempting to divide the United States um, and, and sway us politically. So I guess, can you give us an overview of like how the Chinese attempts compared to the Russian attempts and what differences there are in the strategies and, you know, what what your take is on on these two sort of parallel threats? 
Well, it's a very good question. Uh, and uh, as with a lot of life, it's not so easy. There are some similarities and there are some differences. Uh, but I'll deal in the world of generalities to try to help make it a little more clear about what is different about what we face from the Communist Party of China. And I'll keep using the words Communist Party of China because it's, the, it's really, really important to disaggregate an ethnicity, a culture, and, every, and the people from a government that they bear some responsibility for allowing to rule over them, but they're suffering under it. Uh, and so Russia today is not the Soviet Union that was before, but it has some similar attributes. And one of the attributes, I don't know if it comes kind of from culture, but we're dealing in generalities, but you have a bit more monolithic population. That might strike some people as strange, given that most people think of China as very monolithic, but China actually has hundreds of old dialects that are tied together, many, many very disaggregated cultures that were basically brought under one umbrella by wars and other kinds of things. They have a fertile crescent around some of the rivers that go into the Pacific Ocean where there's been continuity, but all of these other areas have had people trading across the Asian continent, up from India and the Southern subcontinent, from Southeast Asia and in, and from the oceans in, and it's all very, very different. Uh, but for Russia, they have a unifying religion for the most part. Uh, it, to a lot of outsiders, they have a hard time identifying who's from a different part of Russia. Uh, and in terms of how they have engaged the West, there's a certain coarseness and bluntness to what they do. In some ways, they don't hide it. It's, it's very in your face in some ways. And they, they don't really have the kind of subtlety that the Chinese information operations have had for a long time. Uh, and growing out of the Cold War, a lot of what the Russians did, they did themselves. And they would have what some people uncharitably would call useful idiots who might be Americans of some station in life who would carry their messages or uh, help build relations for them. That's kind of spy versus spy standard stuff. What the Chinese Communist Party had done was to put forward a very open and friendly face, a facade, uh, and offer kind of this opportunity for great wealth, access to a great civilization, research opportunities, uh, to allow for manufacturing to be aggregated in one location. Uh, the power of one party rule meant that there weren't protests or hearings about whether a project was going to be approved. Uh, there was no EPA to step in and review things for several, several years before a large plant could be built. There was no politics of a generation of families having their land, their farms, their homesteads taken away from them by uh, eminent domain. Uh, and so China used the developing country narrative together with this opportunity of just, we're just focusing on progress and profits. We're not going to engage in politics, but what they did was to aggregate ties to the most powerful leaders of every meaningful industry to access the ties that would control where source materials for manufacturing come from the ties that control what news and entertainment industries are going to put onto screens and into people's livelihoods, to control the supply of necessary medical devices and medicines, uh, and to in some ways control your research grants and what is allowed speech and activity on your campuses uh, by way of a flood of fully paid for international students to many of our universities. Again, getting to that missionary impulse, Americans want these kinds of things. We want to think the best of other people. We want to welcome them in. We think we've got a good shot at selling them on the merits. And if they just see how good our culture, the welcoming of our community is, that they would be wowed by that. And they would want to take some of that back to their own country and the world would be a better place. Uh, 
And I don't want to say that that's not possible or true. But with the Communist Party of China, over multiple decades, what has happened is that they have used those relationships to manipulate American industry, American entertainment, American investment, and American government to make it so that what I would call the warm bath of conventional thinking or a soothing scenario of development with China is the dominant way of understanding and engaging China. No longer are you allowed to ask tough questions, to cha challenge their narrative. You're free to challenge your own American narrative, and they gladly encourage you to do that. But you are not free to challenge these other things, or someone will come and visit you and say, I'd sure hate for something to happen to that grant that funds your department at your university. I'd sure hate for your friend to lose his position at Goldman Sachs because you are engaging in politics that are hurting the feelings of 1.2 billion Chinese people. I hope that you are not going to undermine your church's effort to build faith-based connections with churches in China because you are dangerously supporting human rights activists who we understand you good Americans wanna think are doing good things, but you need to understand these people are hurting the Chinese people and we need to work with you to pull back from those policies on human rights that you wanna talk about. There is an effectiveness and a subtlety to that. Now, in the 1990s, that was done human to human. And by way of your boss, uh, your funder, uh, your audience, what have you. Today, it is done by way of unseen artificial intelligence and technology. And so it's harder to see, it's harder to feel, it's harder to even know that you have opted into someone getting into your brain and not just into your brain, into your feelings and into your relationships and into your contacts. And I would be willing to say, it's okay if that's your free will and choice, but you need to give informed consent. You need to know what you've, what you've signed on for. If you were to put something into your body, you would want to know what are my risks? What am I getting into? And we know we live in an imperfect world on that regard. I would just draw the analogy that China has perfected and modernized a, a, a technological, psychological approach that uh, is much more powerful than the medicine analogy that I used. And that's why, that's what's different. Russia never dreamt of having this breadth of access and influence uh, that the Chinese Communist Party now finds itself with. So that's the biggest difference. Russia was more in your face. China is deal, be, be, kind of working into the deep foundations and up from there. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my, my final question is uh, regarding solutions to this. So what has been attempted in the past by the United States? Um, have there been diplomatic efforts to resolve this issue or confront China on it? And, and how have those efforts been faring? And then um, looking towards Congress, uh, we've been seeing some um, more recent efforts from both sides of the aisle to uh, past legislation to deal with this. So could you give us an overview of that um, and, and the chances sure. you think has of success? Well, very, very good uh, questions on this. Uh, now, uh, I, I strongly support your initial question of have we actually confronted the Chinese about this? Uh, and even though I have uh, plenty of partisanship in my background and I would like every once in a while to throw shade at the, those that I don't support, but I would say that uh, in reality, administrations, Republican and Democrat going back 20 plus years have challenged the Chinese leaders on what they were doing. Uh, and I think that we'd have to say that up until fairly recently, there's been no measurable effect. The Chinese Communist Party is outstanding in maintaining a stoic face. Listen to you deliver your talking points, ignore every single thing you said, and then deliver their talking points and call it a good meeting. Uh, and that's basic, you know, meet with Chinese officials 101. Uh, and so that's what's happened. So we're now at the front end of how Americans and others around the world take action to do something about this. And uh, in the United States, there are some moves in Congress, but I would say that most of the positive policy entrepreneurship is happening in our states. And I think that's appropriate because all of our states are, have their own sovereignty, they're closer to the people, uh, and all of our states are different. 
I've run for elected office and every elected system, election system in our country is different state by state. That might be maddening to some people, but it's in some ways beautiful. And the same thing is said for how you want to approach public policy. So in some states, we have governors issuing uh, executive orders that are uh, mandating that government employees shall not install uh, apps like TikTok on their government provided devices. Uh, we have legislatures that are trying to ban uh, TikTok from being used more broadly than just government devices. We have a proposal. I was recently in South Dakota, a very warm and beautiful place in the middle of winter to go to South Dakota. Uh, I can promise you it was warm under the dome, very hospitable people, but bone chilling cold outside. But they were debating a kind of committee approach so that uh, when uh, when any entity wanted to buy agricultural land, especially those that might be near sensitive sites, that there would be a review process and that recommendations would be made to the governor and the governor would be able to either pass or block any kind of sensitive transaction based on national security. Um, I believe your audio may have uh, not been working. Is that just me? No, you're correct, Tova. Steve, we can't hear I you. Can, hear. <clears throat> can you try again? Right after the land uh, transfer part. Yeah, the committee, we, we lost you. The, I think South Dakota, they were doing a committee approach. Can we hear, can we hear you now, Steve? Try to say so. Can you hear us, Steve? Can you hear? Can you hear us? Okay. He can't hear us. Oh, so okay. huh? Um, maybe if he gets off and gets back on. Um, here. Let's see. I wish, can, can we like reboot? <laughs> Maybe R he can call in and stay on the phone and uh, stay R on video. Oh yeah, he could just call it D -E O O T. So write it out for him, Aubrey, reboot. Can you write it out on a, the back of that 30 minute thing? Okay. Yeah. Maybe he understood my side. He's rebooting. He's gonna try doing to that. Let's take an opportunity while Steve is getting that back. On. Let's uh, let's take an opportunity to welcome our students who are with us here today. Uh, we have got Katie Dice with two homeschool students, and Kimberly Hammers with Grassfield uh, High School in Chesapeake with twenty three students, and then Maria Wright, the Wright family, uh, is homeschooling, and and Maria's got her homeschool students with us. And Janine Kimberly Hammers, uh, our teacher with Grassfield High School, said, Janine Turner is amazing. I would love to invite her as a panelist with the Virginia Council for the Social Studies for one of our webinars known as Scholars Hour. How could I, as vice president of the educator organization, extend such an invitation formally? So, Kimberly, we will be in touch with you right after this. Uh, consider it extended. And let's see. Yes, I would love now. to do that. Love it. Okay, Steve. love it. Thank you. Okay, Steve, when you we lost you when you were talking about the committee approach in South Dakota. Ah, okay. Well, so Christy Nome had put forward a proposal that has a committee that will review any kind of purchase of ag land uh, that might be sensitive, either because of who's involved in the transaction or because of the location of that land. Uh, and so you have uh, some approach in some legislatures of a ban on purchase, foreign purchase of ag land, or maybe troubled countries purchase of ag land, uh, but then others that are looking at any land that is close to military facilities. Basically, I say let a thousand flowers bloom and whatever the right starting point is for each state, let's see how they are able to implement these things. I tend to be uh, more of the review committee approach 
because I don't think our federal government has the capacity to do this for over 300 million people. Uh, and people closer to the action in their states could do a better job. Uh, and I think they could also respect the interests of the farmers who just want to grow a product and feed the world. Uh, and that's an important part of who we are as Americans. But even those same farmers that want that profit and to feed the world don't want the Communist Party of China to be their neighbors. They don't want to help them be close to sensitive national security sites. So I think that interactive model is the way to go. But whether it's TikTok or Agland or universities that have Confucius Institutes and other influence operations, uh, all of this activism is now in the states and localities. And I would just encourage everyone to look for where those conversations are, whether it's in New York City about this stealth police department, or whether it's ag land in Florida, South Dakota, Texas, anywhere else, uh, or whether it's the activities on universities. Where is that endowment money coming from? Where, uh, where is that retirement fund that state taxpayer funded getting invested into? And is it getting invested in ways that are making this threat bigger and stronger against us? Or is it clean from that? And so I think those are the starting points that we can engage. Uh, and I think that if we see successes that can build on other successes, then Congress and the future administration can build on that to get our policy ship of state on a solid foundation in the right direction, getting away from that bad bet that we talked about at the beginning. This show's been uh, amazing so far, Honorable Steve Yates. And um, so please, we'll try to rush through some questions here since we had the technical difficulty for a moment. Um, but so try to, I'm gonna say a bunch of stuff and maybe you can fact check some of it, um, um, uh, use it, uh, re-say it with your expertise. But there's a lot of information that we've heard bits and pieces of. We don't source it. Many of us that can't don't have a job where we can specialize in it. We're not able to understand this information. Um, but everything from the starting with TikTok, that TikTok has an algorithm beyond what our most of our social media sites can handle, and it can really hone in and, and feed us uh, very similar. Our brains react very similarly to a drug that it will actually look at our eye movements and our facial expressions, and that it consciously does understand even that non-virtuous things we're talking about. Anything that's going to elicit lust or anything like that is actually going to be more useful as a drug. Um, and it is reaching a younger and younger and younger generation than other, a younger child at this point than other apps have in the past. So all other apps have had that issue. This one is reaching kids in a more potent way at a younger age, that it's changing the way the brain works to work in 15 second snippets um, where that medium is fine. But it's like if you want to live on chicken nuggets, you, if you're going to live on really good chicken nuggets or you're going to live on fake chicken nuggets, either way, you're probably going to be unhealthy. But if you live on fake chicken nuggets that are mostly glue, then you're going to be really, really unhealthy. And that's what it's like using TikTok, that in any way you look at it, it's not going to be a healthy form of absorbing information. And it's also pulls relationships apart because we're all looking now the social part of social media is really down to influencers period and how I can re-put something that influencers already done and get the most attention for it by redoing what they're doing. And there's not much communication by the form of direct messaging that was so popular like AOL back in the 90s when that came out. And that Facebook and these other social media sites originally were built around community and that doesn't exist the same way. So even when we see some awesome cooking thing on TikTok, that's great to watch. As we continue to do that, it is actually changing the way we perceive our world and is dangerous. Apart from that, it, the China, that the CCP, as you've correctly stated, is um, using that um, to divide us. So can you comment on uh, that whole host of things? And is anything there wrong? Um, is anything there not quite? Or uh, can you just talk to us about that? Well, I, there's nothing in what you said that I would fact check or body check or whatever else. Uh, I think you had a pretty solid sum up of what the nature of the influence operation is. There are several books that have been written and probably some documentaries too that talk about the powerful psychology behind social media and the devices that we use. There is an entire department in cell phone manufacturers that studies only the physiological reaction to how something feels in your hand and the impact that has on your brain and your, your behaviors. Uh, there's also 
lots of science behind the idea of what it really takes to study something, to critically analyze something, to engage in a real conversation. And as you exactly correctly pointed to, that isn't possible if you have a physiological addiction to a notification, something that's pulling you back into that app. You, you psychologically, but even physically, can't leave it aside. Everyone knows that they've walked into a cafe or a restaurant and seen an entire family or some soulless couple on a date, and both of them are buried in their hands. I wish that it were only the youth, but I see plenty of middle-aged people that are walking blindfolded down the street into other people because they're stuck in the palm of their hand. That is the power of this technology, the programming. It's physical in the devices, but the algorithms take it to the nth degree with software. Uh, and it does draw you in. And what it does is it interrupts the parts of your brain where you would engage in deep thought, where you might engage in deep empathy, where you might be able to do things that are truly civilizational and foundational. And it keeps it you in that, that instant. Yeah, that's amazing. Is it true that in China that they they do not, they have a separate app for youth that uh, is that is the same app, but it it, mur it curates the videos further and limits the amount yes. of time they, they can use it. No, it's the exact same app with a different algorithm. Uh, and so they, they are using this technology to curate what their preferred audience is being fed. Uh, and that is more unifying, it's more edifying from their point of view. And the algorithm that they run for our youth and the wider world is less edifying, less unifying. And that is not a bug, it's a feature. All right, we could, just like Janine said, it is a fascinating conversation that gets down to some of the fundamental truths of America as well as we juxtapose it with um, communist China, the CCP. Um, and as well, I recently got, started to scratch the surface of how the CCP came into power. So if you wanted to throw out any any books that maybe people should read because it's actually uh, what you said about China being not being what we think it is and that they are not necessarily a communist um, uh, culture. Right. It, it does help to understand yeah. how the CCP really took hold. Um, and then I'll pa after that, thank you very much. I'll pass it to Kathy for any audience questions. Well, excellent thoughts. Uh, there are many books that people can jump into, so don't take my recommendation as the only one. But I do think it's, a, it's an interesting and thought-provoking and, in my view, accurate starting point. There's an author named Bill Hayton, and he has a book called The Invention of China. And what he does is sort of pillar by pillar, from culture to religion to geography, history, uh, ethnicity, it breaks the legs out from under this myth of this multi-thousand year old unified civilization that dominated the world or was the most advanced in the world. And it isn't meant, and it doesn't in fact denigrate the Chinese people, it just tells the truth. Uh, and, uh, and so for those who were not raised in the Cold War, you probably did, weren't raised with a lot of conversation about communism. And socialism, it wasn't really until recent social unrest in the United States that people talked very often about socialism and communism outside of political wonk circles. It just didn't seem real. The history was over, the free world won, capitalism was supreme. What is this crazy talk of these other systems? Uh, but, the, but that book, The Invention of China, will help you dive in. Uh, it's very well sourced. Uh, and again, it just gives building blocks of why do we think certain things about China when here's some evidence of a multicultural area. Here's some evidence of communism being a European ideology that was exported to China. It's not something that China invented or has anything to do with Chinese people or history or culture. Uh, it has more to do with control, which is not actually a Chinese attribute. And I would just leave one anecdote I know we want to try to get a few more questions in, but you can tell what a culture respects based on the words that are in its language. And traditional Chinese language had separate words for aunt and uncle and cousin based on whether that person was older or younger than your father, older than, or younger than your mother, older or younger than you. And that is a physical manifestation 
of a large family that happened in traditional cultures all around the world. But in China, that was so important, it was literally written into their language. Now, with simplified characters and two generations of a one-child policy, not only are those words completely gone, there is no such thing as cousin or uncle. Think of the cultural damage that has done. That is not traditional China. That is Communist Party of China control. And you can see it through the language. But Bill, in his book, will talk about a little bit of that. So please jump in. I get nothing for promoting his book other than getting more people to think critically about this stuff. Well, that's fascinating. And, and thank you all for those great questions. Steve, Robert Zimmerman asks, what is to stop them from buying ag land and just leaving it fallow and so reducing our ability to produce the needed food in this country? Uh, so it's not just near air bases. It should not ever be allowed. We cannot buy an acre in China. So why should we allow them anything here? Well, he ends on what I think is the core principle we should start with. And that is reciprocity, which is a fancy pants word of we can't do it there, they can't do it here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems fair. Now, my granddad taught me there's no such thing as fairness in life, but it's an ideal maybe we want to trend towards. And so if this is just following the golden rule, this is the way they want to treat us. We wish it were otherwise, but this is how we're going to treat them. I think there's something different about the Chinese Communist Party of China than, say, the British wanting to invest and own farmland. And I think we should have monitoring, transparency, and accountability. So if we can do those things, I think we'll be on the right track. But the, the question is heading in the right direction. They shouldn't have any land. That's a privilege, not a right. Well, thank you. And then I know you've got to go here in just a minute. But uh, real quick, Dan Renzel asks, what should the US be doing about trade with China? And do you favor any limitations? I do favor some limitations because I think they're an unusual entity and that they don't have our best interests or free market principles at heart. Uh, I have a colleague named Ambassador Bob Lighthizer, who was the former US trade representative. He talks about strategic decoupling, which again is a, a very high-minded word, which basically means we can't change everything overnight. We built for decades the dependencies that we have, but anything that is vital to our livelihood and our national security, we need to begin separating those ties from China now. And gradually over time, we should build positive alternatives with those who don't hate us, with those who will follow transparency and the rule of law. And there are enough of them around the world on which to build that, that platform. So that's where I would go. Well, thank you. And that's a great way to end it. And I know you've got to go in just a minute, but Janine, any closing comments? I have a closing quick question. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Steve Yates, again, I just hear, hear and Emmy to you. You're amazing. Quick, uh, quick <laughs> question. When you when you said uh, uncles and cousin or, or those words aren't allowed anymore, that's really interesting to me. And I can see some parallels in our society now, but why would they allow those words in society? What, what was? What, because those humans don't exist. There aren't uncles, there aren't cousins. After two generations of one child families, all you have is two parents and four grandparents. Your parents don't have brothers and sisters, and so you have no uncles and aunts. Oh. And so then those words disappear because the humans have disappeared and your culture is less. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I thought I thought the words weren't allowed, and and I uh, I missed that part. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't be yeah. understood. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. What a great show. My pleasure. Thank We're you. We're gonna let you jump off, Steve, and we want to thank our audience for being with us, and invite you to come back next week, Tuesday at two p.m. Eastern for Fentanyl and the Border, and we're gonna have. Uh, Chad Wolf with us, the former acting secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. So thank you all. And thank you, Steve, very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Brilliant. Wonderful.